Where are you looking for truth? Feelings, government agencies, politicians, entertainment personalities, music, within, yourself, spirits. Solomon has given us a compass to guide us. So read widely, but be a person of just one book. If it comes down to who's right, God is right. Far from giving us the aha moment, often discovering how great minds accomplished great things leaves us more bewildered than enlightened. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever seen anything where you think, um, you know, I want to understand that. I want to learn about that. And so you you hear a lecture on on a particular subject and the the guy or, or the woman that invented it tells you how. And when you're done, you think, I have no idea. I still, I still don't understand how, how that's done. You know, for example, uh, every elementary school child has heard of Albert Einstein's equation, E equals MC squared. But how many of us really understand Einstein's mind or his method? If you've ever heard him uh, talk about or, or read what he said about uh, the research and study that went into this, uh, he talks about how fatiguing and difficult it was to to uh, come to this realization. That's hard for you and me. You know, it's like, well, it's a math problem. How hard could it be? You know, well, that just shows how little we know. And <laughs> so, but how many of us really understand the man or his method or his mind? Or we might watch a documentary on quantum computing and still walk away having no idea how it works or what to do with this newfound information. Have you heard of quantum computing? Have you? Nobody? Just a few? Anybody? Okay, well, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for bailing me out, Ben. I appreciate this is for you. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I mean, I've looked into that. I've heard about it. And honestly, this is my personal testimony. After about an hour or two of watching th- videos and learning and trying to, I have, still have no idea what quantum computer, computing is. And so uh, we oftentimes hear of how great things are done by great minds and great people, but we still really have no idea how they did it. Um, such is true also with the, those great souls who like, Enoch in Genesis have walked with God and simply left mankind behind. We think of men like Abraham and Joseph, Moses, David, the prophets of the Old Testament, Paul the Apostle or John, Augustine or Athanasius, Irenaeus, Martin Luther, John Calvin, William Tyndall, Jonathan Edwards, Samuel Rutherford, Richard Sibbs, and on and on we could go of these men who, whom God used, who knew God um, and the Scriptures on such a level that they shook not only their own homes or their own uh, communities, but in many ways the world uh, with, by their walk with God. And yeah, we can read their books, we can hear the testimonies, we can read the biographies, but we still don't really know Uh, I'm not even sure sometimes they know. If you read Daniel, you you hear Daniel, he receives a prophecy and oftentimes says he sat down for many hours trying to understand the prophecy that he just received. And so God does some amazing things like that. In the few closing statements of Ecclesiastes, the writer speaks of mind, method, message, and maturity. He shares how Solomon used words as an artisan, how the preacher sought uh, and found understanding of truth, reality, God, eternity, sin, self, and salvation through certain means. In his search for meaning, purpose, and happiness in a fallen earthly world under the sun, that often feels empty, it has led him to solid ground 
and the truth, the true truth, as Francis Schaeffer uh, liked to say. So in these final verses, we, we find out he shares with us what, how he's been doing what he has done in the book of Ecclesiastes. He gives us his method, as it were, and, and talks about the, meth, the message that he has uh, at the end. And quite honestly, the over underlying theme we might see here is that even in this fallen world, even in this uh, dark, you know, troubling, often painful world that we live in, there is truth and there is happiness available uh, to us. And so I want to break it down for us uh, quickly. Uh, that number one, we see that I believe Solomon is saying in verses 9 and 10, look for truth in the written word. He says, look for truth in the written word. Because you might, you might look at this section in verses 9 and 10. Besides being wise... The preacher also taught the people knowledge and weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. You might think, well, what does that have to do with anything we've been studying? Or you might think, well, what a nice little conclusion, you know, to this whole section. That, you know, he wrote this fascinating theological, philosophical treatise and used a lot of fancy word arrangement to, to pull it off. I don't think for one minute that that's what God is giving us here in these verses. No, I think what he's saying to his readers is that if you want to understand the things like what I've given you in this book of Ecclesiastes, then you need to do what the preacher, Koheleth, the wise man, the lecturer, Solomon, you need to do what he did. You need to look for truth in the written word. Uh, and, and this is very, very important um, in every generation. But maybe in this generation, more than ever, have we had more temptations to look for truth somewhere else? Now, it's always been out there. You know, you've always had the Eastern religions that look for truth on the, in, on the, on the inside. You, those are very ancient religions. Um, you, you've always had some that looked for truth in the physical realm with, through idolatry, uh, you've always had some that looked for truth through physical experience or union with nature and these kinds of things. Um, but in our age, with this type of technology, the image, the, the experience, um, the feelings, these types of things are uh, more powerful than ever. Um, I mean, yes, in ancient times, people carried their little little idol. They'd have a little miniature idol, and they'd carry it with them, just like we carry our phones, you know. <laughs> but today, uh, people aren't carrying the little idol, but no, you have a whole library of idols if, you want, if that's what you want to do with this. Or it itself can become an idol. Whatever, you know, however Satan and the flesh wants and presses us to use it or misuse it, uh, then that's way, the way we will go. So the writer of Ecclesiastes, the preacher, draws our understanding to the basic reality. Yes, the preacher is wise, he says in verse 9 uh, at the very beginning. Be, besides being wise, he's not just complimenting uh, Solomon. This is probably a scribe putting an ending on the book, but the, he's not just complimenting him. He's saying, besides, don't get caught up 
in thinking that Solomon is the only one who has the truth. That only the wise men can have it. No. What he's trying, I think, to say to us is, is that, no, it's our duty to be students of the written word, to grow in wisdom, to search for it uh, as he did. And so, yes, he's, the preacher is wise uh, with a wisdom granted by God himself, but this wisdom was to be shared and taught and communicated with others through the medium of words. Notice how he says it, the being wise, besides being wise, the preacher also taught what? The people. Taught the people. You see, in many of the ancient religions or, or even um, secret religions, secret societies, there's been this, uh, the esoteric, you know, few that have the truth. You know, this is what Gnosticism or Greek philosophy mingled with early Christianity tried to do. They tried to create the, the select few who had a market on the truth. And this is why in, in Colossians and 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, uh, and even some in the Gospel of John, um, there is this constant attack uh, toward Gnosticism because the Gnostics were falling into this, this trap. So notice in verse 9 and 10 how the preacher taught. He taught the people, not just an elite. He taught them knowledge of right and wrong, of God and sin and eternity. He taught them by weighing, studying, and arranging words. Many, he says, many proverbs. He did all of this with great care. Isn't it funny that last Sunday we talked about how our Lord seemed to use a lot of proverbs. And here we are closing up Ecclesiastes and he says, the preacher, the wise man, studied many proverbs and arranged words in such a way. Solomon searched to find the right words so that he could write in such a way that his writings were gushing with the words that contain the truth about God, reality, and life. You see, it's so easy for us to think that we just think of words. Uh, but if you do any writing, if you, if you, as one of my friends calls it a lot, wordsmithing, uh, if you do any of that, you know, you think of a blacksmith who's, you know, he's taking, he's heating the metal, he's hammering the metal, he's bending it and shaping it and creating out of it the tool or the instrument, whatever's needed, or it might even be ornamental. But out of this pounding and the heat and all of the hours of work comes this thing that's so needed, whether it be a hammer head or, or an ax head, a horse's bit or, or shoe or who knows. But something very valuable could even be an, a, a sword of, or a shield. Well, the same is true of words. The right use of words might be, as we've said many times, more powerful than the, than the sword. Words change the world for good or for bad. Well, why is that? And who made it that way? Well, quite honestly, God. God is the one that made it that way. He fixed truth in the written word. And that is so vitally important that we get that. Now, uh, let me just show you some passages that help us uh, digest this a little bit throughout the scriptures. We see first uh, that all truth is God's truth, as Augustine said. Notice the very first verses of the Bible. In the beginning, God created heaven, the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then what happens? God said the Word. It's not an accident 
that the new creation theology of the New Testament is built upon this spoken power of God's Word in the Old Testament. Over and over we hear the power of God's Word and how His Word is what brings things to life. His Word brings things into existence. Creation out of nothing. It's the Word. And of course, God spoke it, but eventually He's going to have His prophet Moses write it. Why? So that the people might know. As Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, God gave us truth through the use of words, or more properly, His words. Okay? Now, we had to have language, and He gave us language, but encapsulated in written language, spoken but then written, encapsulated in this, God would affix truth, reality. The more I learn, the more I'm amazed that everything has to come back to the tangible, objective, written word. And in postmodernism, one of the problems we have had is this attack on written language. That words no longer mean what they have always meant. You can't interpret uh, grammar and syntax the same way you have always interpreted it. Well, what's that done? It has dug up the foundation of truth and reality, which is where we are today. It's what's gotten us in this mess. And quite honestly, it's amazing to me how much Solomon has had to say in the book of Ecclesiastes to modernism and postmodernism. Um, in fact, so much that uh, Peter Lathart has written a book called Solomon and the Postmoderns. Uh, so I'm not the only one seeing it there. Um, but it, it's, it's this understanding that God has fixed truth in the written word. And we see it again in Exodus 20 when he gave his commandments. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves any carved image. And then he continues to give us the rest of his divine commandments. And how did he give us those commandments? Tablets. Words written in stone. God's truth is to be passed from one generation to the next the same way. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we see that, that we're to teach our children the statutes, the rules that the Lord your God has given you. So there's this, this written word of God and His statutes, His commandments, His covenants, the things that He gave Moses and the Pentateuch are to now be, to be communicated to the next generation and the one after that. Traditionalism? No. Truth. If it's not passed down, the next generation is without truth. That's the quite honestly, that's the point of the whole the whole point of the book of Judges. The refrain in the book of Judges is, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And where did that begin? It began in the first chapter where it said, and the, the generation of Joshua passed away. And the next generation rose up who did not know the commandments and covenants of God. And therefore, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And what was the result? The, the, the covenant people of God killed each other, committed adulter, uh, uh, idolatry, uh, all kinds of debauchery and sin. It was a disaster. And what's the point? The point is this is what happens to the people of God when they forsake the commandments of God. That is, that's why Judges is like a rated R movie. You say, really? Is that in the Bible? Yeah. Maybe you'll read it now. Just kidding. 
All right, so God's truth is to be passed on. Truth, uh, true truth leads back to God. Now, uh, Solomon has already told us in Proverbs, in chapter 1, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will you scoffers delight in your scoffing? And fools hate knowledge. What makes them fools? They hate the knowledge of God. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. So truth demands that it be shared. That's, that's why I've never understood you know, preachers that spend so much time saying, you know, you need to apply the things that you've heard. Well, if you really learn, if you learn, learn, and are, are shaped by what you have learned, then your behavior changes. That's, that's just... We haven't fully learned until our behavior changes. We might know some things, but, you know, and I, I know in some of the Christian education class, I'm accessing some of that right now. In, in those classes, they talk about, you know, the correction and enrichment of concepts. That you correct wrong, but you fill that in with right, and that creates a different behavior. We get that in the epistles. We have the doctrine, then we have the application. Right doctrine produces right living. We see that true truth leads back to God. He says, desire wisdom. Search for it. And where is it to be found? In God's words. So the search for truth begins with God and goes back to God. And I think that's exactly the ideas behind what he's giving us here. And if we miss that, if we missed the objective word of God, the words of God, of God. God gave us a living example through his son, the living word. This is no accident. Wisdom is personified in the book of, of, of Proverbs and wisdom becomes flesh or the word becomes flesh in John's gospel, verse one. In the beginning was the word, the logos, and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Notice how the Word is a Him. So we have the written Word and the living Word. The written Word is the, the Scriptures. The living Word is Jesus Christ. But understand how these connect. Jesus is the embodiment of this Word of God uh, that, that we see, this wisdom taught in the Old Testament. This is not Greek philosophy. It's Old Testament theology. So Solomon searched to find the right words so that he could write in such a way that his writings were gushing with the words that contained the truth about God, reality, and life. Where are you looking for truth? Images? Feelings? Government agencies? Politicians? Entertainment personalities? Music? Within yourself, spirits, people today are doing all of those. Solomon says the truth, is, the truth is found in words, God's specific word. Then learn from others, but lean on the shepherd's word or learn. Um, I'm sorry, not learn, lean, lean. There we go. I got more in my notes than I have not putting up here. So lean on the shepherd. The shepherd's words. So in, in verses 10 and 11, I'm sorry, 11 and 12, he says, The words of the wise are goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making of many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Amen. Amen, Pete. Much study is a weariness of the flesh. I can remember being in seminary, uh, and and well, and and being at the desk, 
and having a wet cloth that I'm studying and reading and I fall asleep. I wipe the, that I'm studying and reading. <laughs> I don't know what you guys did, but just to stay awake at times. It's a weariness of the flesh uh, to do this. But from these verses, we might conclude that Solomon would agree with the Proverbs, with the proverb, read widely, but be a man of only one book. Solomon is saying here, the making of books, there is no end. He's not saying don't read anything else because he just said the collected sayings. Scholars are constantly trying to prove that the Bible come, came from the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the, the Sumerians uh, and so forth because there are similar phrases or that Moses stole everything from Egypt. No, but there, are, there is wisdom in other places in the world. Did Moses learn from the Egyptians? Well, the Bible itself says that he was trained in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Does that mean he stole religion from the, from the Egyptians? Absolutely not. And anybody that, in fact, the whole Exodus narrative is to, pit, is to show how that the God of the Israelites and his faith is not the same gods uh, or God and gods of the Egyptians. So this is ridiculous. So, but all truth, as Augustine said, is God's truth. So read widely, but be a person of just one book. If it comes down to who's right, God is right. Even if we don't understand how God is right. You see, to know that the truth is contained in words is not enough. To know that truth contained in words is found in God's word. The Holy Scriptures, again, is not enough. To just know this book is truth and the truth of God is not enough. There are groups around the world that will say the Bible is the inspired word of God, but still do not believe in salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. They will still die and go to hell. The Pharisees were one of these, many of whom, you know, many of them got saved, but some didn't. But did they believe the Bible? Sure they did. So to know this is the truth is not enough. And this is what Solomon is saying. Solomon warns us of two things. He warns us that the truth demands action. It changes us. It compels us. It grips us when we have grasped it fully. It's like a goad, he says, that pricks and sticks our minds and consciences, our loves and hatreds, until we are compelled to change our direction to be in line with the commandments of God. A goad is a stick that has either been sharpened at the end or has a nail affixed to it that uh, shepherds use to get wayward sheep to get back on the right path. It's a goad. This is what Jesus told Paul on the Damascus road. He said, Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the prick or against the goad. Many times you, you poke the cow or the bull or even a sheep, they might kick back because it hurt, okay? This is what he's saying. The Spirit of God has been convicting Paul, and Paul is pushing back. Well, here we're, this, we see maybe where that idea came from, right here in the book of Ecclesiastes, where he says that the, that the Word of God uh, goads us to do what God has commanded us, to be obedient to the commandments. The words of the wise... And who are the wise here? Not just some random educated professor. Okay. The wise here are those who know and live the commandments of God. That's who he's talking about. So the words of the wise are like goads. They prick. Sayings. They are given, they, they are given it by one shepherd. So there's the idea of the shepherd who's picking the, the sheep to get them to go in the right direction. 
My son, beware of anything beyond these. Beyond what? Beyond the written words of God. Beyond the commandments. Beware of anything beyond true wisdom, which is what? The Holy Scriptures. The making of books, there is no end. So in other words, learning and education, even in ancient times, there were great libraries. There was no end to the books, and there's no end to the books now, and many of which are excellent and wonderful and should be read. But understand that when they cross and move away from the path of truth, it is they that are wrong, not God. And it doesn't matter how many degrees or whatever that they might have to show that they have the authority to correct God's word. No, they do not. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, uses His truth to goad us back into the way. God's truth stings, hurts, burns, and cuts at times. It was not careful. If we're not careful to apply ourselves to it, we may pull back and be confirmed in lies. It was the worst thing that could ever happen to us. When the Word of God stings or cuts, and we pull back from it because we don't want that. Then what's the end result of that? Well, Romans chapter 1 tells us it's that, that confirmation in lies, this inability to discern right from wrong and to even know God, a reprobate mind. But when we realize that the cutting and burning is surgery and cauterizing of dead tissue, we, should, we can embrace the cleansing truth of God's Word. Then lastly, life's meaning is only found in fearing God. Life's meaning is only found in fearing God. Oh, it is found... Life's meaning is found in fearing God. That's, that's the conclusion. If we miss the whole thing, if we miss everything he discussed, he's like, all right, I'll just spell it out for you. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Well, we've considered it all. He says, here we have the conclusion of the conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon has given us a compass to guide us through this fallen world, to lead us from one oasis to another as we pass through the sandy desert of life. He has used words, more specifically God's words, to teach us these many faceted and nuanced truths about navigating what is often a very cruel and unforgiving world and to do it with a profound measure of happiness and joy. And in case you missed this, his point, as we meander through the, the many avenues, curves, and dead ends, he spells it out for us one last time with glowing clarity. The end of the matter, the purpose of the book, the point of the, the discussion, the conclusion of his sermon, we might say, the, the interactive theme. After looking at all the evidence, he says, the guiding star is that the one thing that makes your life and my life full and purposeful and not empty and not useless, that brings us happiness and joy in the midst of much sorrow and suffering, is to live it with the deep and profound love for God. That's what he fear God and keep his commandments. When you see the word fear God, also realize that that fear encompasses loving God. It's not fear, even though it's connected to judgment here, but it's also connected to a love, a, a, a rapture of loving God, that He is what brings us this oasis in the desert of this world. And... Of course, we're getting ready to do a study, Thirsting for God, on worship. 
It's next. And, and I hope you'll see in that this whole imagery right here that we're passing through a desert. Everywhere you look are the bones of what's gone before us, what's died, what once was. But take heart. God is the En Gedi. He is the, the oasis. And someday that'll turn into a river. Give, God has given us a life to live. He will give us the grace in Christ to live it. And whether we fear Him through repentance and faith in His Son Jesus, or we do not, God will be sitting enthroned at the end of each of our lives to weigh it in the balance. That's what Solomon gives us at the end. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So what's the reason for happiness? Well, God has given us life. And, that, and in that life, we can have family. We've talked about that. We can have work and enjoy that. We can have purpose. We can know God Himself, even in a fallen world. And when we're done, we can be with God Himself and be rewarded. And so there is joy. There is happiness, even in the desert. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Coggins Church.